Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Momentum Boost. I am your host, Adrian Gold Davis, and I'm really grateful that you're joining me here today. Now, before we begin, because it's going to be incredible today, I just want to take a minute to invite you to a very special three-part series that's starting this Thursday night at 9 p.m. Eastern time. We're going to be tackling parenting challenges, and heaven knows there's plenty of them, with renowned parenting expert, Dr. G. She's going to share practical, modern strategies on raising strong families. So register now. You can get the link in the chat here beside me. So in this month in Momentum, we're talking about teaching our children, and we're focusing on what that means, both by virtue of who and how and where they're educated and how we model the values that we want to impart. Because as parents, we are actually in partnership with the Almighty in shepherding a soul in the earliest part of its journey. We apprentice them as it were, and we also learn from them. And our job as parents is to dedicate values and guide a child towards achieving their potential, all according to their way. And Judaism teaches us that whenever you spark and nourish the soul of a person, you are as if a parent to them. So I often say parenting is not always a biological function. It's a calling, it's a privilege, and it's a responsibility. Now, some of the commandments that we learn in relation to our responsibility for our kids is found in these statements from our Torah, which is our owner's manual for living an elevated life. So Torah says, you shall not ill-treat any widow or orphan. And Talmud then goes on to say, whoever brings up an orphan in their home, it's as though they gave birth to them. And then we learn, he who brings up a child is to be called its father, not he who gave birth. So reinforces the point that these commandments imply that teaching our children is actually a communal obligation. That is Jews, we're meant to open our hearts and our homes that we're Am Yisrael, one people with one heart, and our responsibility to one another is as much a part of our creating a whole and complete people as one hand is to the other. So adoption and fostering, they're a holy mandate in our tradition. And in a world where so many children are left alone, where the opportunities for better lives are decidedly not equal, it seems to make even more sense than ever. And it's important to note that adoption is an extremely difficult journey sometimes for many people. Many want badly to adopt and might face challenges and even failures along the way. There's various regulations and the process is not always a streamlined one, but despite the challenges, adoption and fostering are powerful, empowering choices. And it can be an empowering choice for both the adoptive and the biological parent. And the decision to choose adoption for a biological child in order to allow for that child to have a better chance in life and the decision to be the parents who wish to enable that dream are equally powerful. And it's not just the children, you know, who are adopted, then fostered, that benefit. It's actually the entire family. So today we have the privilege of learning from Dr. Shmuley Yanklowitz and Simone Kinego. Now you're gonna to wanna to ask our guests a question. So all you're gonna do is type it into the chat box that's on the right. So Rabbi Dr. Shmuley Yanklowitz, he's the president and the dean of Valley Beit Midrash. He's the founder and president of Uri Litzedek. He's the founder and CEO of Shemayim, the Jewish animal advocacy. And he's the founder and the president of Yatom, the Jewish Foster and Adoption Network. He's the author of 17 books on Jewish spirituality, social justice, and ethics. He's a father of four and a foster parent. And the lovely Simone Kinego is a former CPA 
who turned equestrian entrepreneur, who turned into a teacher, who's the mother of six, three of whom she adopted from South Korea and Ethiopia. She's the author of an incredible book, The Extraordinary Unordinary You. Before I bring them on, I want you to take a look at this short, powerful clip. There's a lot of things that keep me up at night, including little babies. <laughs> but the issue among issues that kept me up at night the most has always been vulnerable children, children who are abused or neglected. Our tradition is about orphans. Baby Moses is raised outside of his home. Esther loses her parents and is raised by Mordechai. It's about time that the Jewish community is stepping up for those within our community and sometimes outside of our community that are in need of loving support during the most challenging times of adoption and foster care. I was a member of the first cohort of the Atom. I entered the cohort as a single woman in grad school. I was really only interested in private adoption at the time. I was kind of scared of foster care. However, through the rabbi's experiences, words of wisdom, and connections in the child welfare system. I really learned about the at-risk youth in our community. And it kind of made foster care a little less scary for a single woman. It also opened my eyes to how I could impact the world one foster placement at a time. In total, I have had four foster placements and I've had one foster to adopt placement. I adopted my little girl in October, 2020. I do owe my family, Yatom and the rabbi. It is so humbling to be in your presence, both of you. Thank you for joining me today. It's just an honor. And I really want to get right into it, if it's okay with you. Just that clip and seeing how that woman went from, from fostering and actually coming to adopt. I see that it's a fluid process for some people. Let's begin with this. Let's talk about fostering first, because I think that it's the one with the most misconceptions around it. It seems to me that if you're going to have a short-term child in your home, when I say short-term, I mean it's not a permanent adoption. I would imagine that the motivation behind that in the family is to impart certain values that your family stands for, things that you believe. How would you go ahead and make the greatest impact in a limited amount of space and time with a child who will not stay with your family entirely, completely, forever. So let's start with you, Simone. So we fostered um, a little girl from, she was actually a student um, in my class and her parents had been arrested and they, she was 10 years old and she was put into a teen shelter. And as soon as we heard that, my husband and I both said, you know, we'd like her to come stay with us. You know, I think the most important thing for us is that we, she was, completely part of our family. Everything we did, every decision we made, she was part of it. Um, you know, we have to remember that we have no idea, you know, where, what these kids have been through, um, what they know, what they don't know. And for us, it was really kind of showing love, um, self-respect, kindness, everything that, you know, under, making her understand that she was important and she mattered and that she, you know, has value and our kids, you know, completely embraced her as well. It, it, it was such a powerful thing for us. Wow. What about you, Rabbi Shmuley? I, it seems to me, I mean, fostering is your gig, right? I know Simone, you adopted three children, but Rabbi Shmuley, especially as a rabbi, as a person who teaches Jewish values, what's your, do you have an agenda going into fostering? Is it, as Simone says, to show and give love? And can a person receive love when they know it's only temporary? Just sort of fill me in on what some of those emotional states might be. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me to this amazing program. And, um, and Simone, it's inspiring to learn from you. And this is a, a topic very close to my heart, especially what you're raising right now. Indeed, the hardest part for our family is always not absorbing the child and not the late nights um, or the night terrors or whatever, it's when they leave. It's when they leave um, because we don't always know that they're going to uh, a place that um, 
will be safe and loving for them. And that's very hard because when you have a foster children in your home, you raise your biological children in the same way you raise them by and large. And you treat them with the same love as if they're one of your children. And then immediately they can leave at, at, a, moment's, at a moment's notice. And so the, the values we try to teach <clears throat> because we foster young children are not the spoken ones as much as the unspoken ones, the feelings of trust, the feelings of love and respect, the patience we strive to demonstrate on our good days um, and you know, being present and responsive and helping them to rebuild their inner core that they can trust people, they can receive love um, <clears throat> and that their love can also be received. And but so Rick, it is- a, oh, Sorry, go ahead. Please, no, please, no, please, go ahead. No, 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 I interrupted, it was rude. Go ahead, please. <laughs> no, I, and uh, it is indeed very complicated, but similar to what Simone said, um, we view our biological children as partners in this. And so they're a part of a healing team that absorbs them. Whoa, okay, let's just hold on to that for a minute. Simone, tell me, how did your children, you, your, your children were on side like Rabbi Shmulizar when you brought in this young woman? And how did you get them on side? What kind of things do you say? What is the value that you are trying to teach them and model for them? So I think it's really um, so important to take a look at just how we raise our kids on a, on a daily basis, the kind of respect we show to them, the kind of respect that they show to us. Um, we didn't have the opportunity to tell the kid, like this happened in literally a moment's notice when she, when they were able to bring her over, we already had a home study in place from our last adoption. And so when we said that um, we'd like to open our home, um, she was there three hours later. So basically the kids got home from school and I said to them, um, you know, this is what's happening. And the kids were like, that's amazing. We have a room for her. And then they saw her walk up to the house and she was carrying um, a cardboard box with a few items in it. And that was the moment where it became real. And, and they were young, but it became so real for them. And they said, mom, can, can we go to the store? Can we let her pick out her own bedding so that she feels like she has something that she chose? Um, can, can we get her more clothes? You know, all of these things where, you know, that's what the, the kids like notice. And to me, that was a moment in time where I was like, okay, you guys got this. Like they really understood, you know, the power of community and the importance of family and caring for other people. Oh, is that your experience too, Rabbi Shmuley, with your, you know, with your children, your biological children? Absolutely. They fully embrace this um, in, in every possible way. Of course, there are many challenging moments, but they uh, learn that life is about service and that service is included in the home and that children are going to arrive. They're going to touch their stuff. They're going to be noisy. It's going to be hard, but they know they gain more than they lose by by investing in those relationships and, and being partners in that. Is there ever any hostility? Let's say a child who comes is difficult, is not integrating properly. What, how, what do you teach them when, how do you teach them to, it's a message all parents need to learn, how to love through the challenges, how, how to be able to set boundaries without withdrawing love. How do you do that? Both of you, for both of you. Yeah, I mean, I think for, for us, if we, you know, again, we, we only fostered um, one time and obviously we adopted three times, but, you know, having them in the moment, understanding these, you know, something that we want to, to teach them and moments are tough. I mean, you know, especially like when, I think the hardest thing is when a child knows that they're about to leave, right? So like um, towards the end of the time period that we had this little girl with us, when we got closer to the end, she started fighting back a lot more. And I'm sure it wasn't because she was upset. It has nothing to do with us, right? It has to do with the unknown of what's coming for her. Yeah. So everything we did was really kind of, you know, bringing her back to those moments and having the other kids understand like, hey, we all have our moments, right? Like this is, it's working through something and just showing the patience. I mean, that's the biggest thing and understanding again, that we have no idea where she started, what idea, no idea what she's been through in her 10 years. So, you know, just showing that patience, I think was always so important for us. That's, that's beautiful. I'm curious, Rabbi Shmuley, do the kids ever say you're nicer to the foster kids than you are to us? Well, the way, the area that comes up, and to be honest, this is the most challenging part for me, is when bedtimes overlap. 
Uh-huh. And our children are good sleepers uh, because thank God they haven't had a life of trauma. Right. But children who have been traumatized and arrive in our home are very afraid of the dark, have a lot of time falling asleep. And I oftentimes have to spend a lot of time with them, getting them to sleep in a way where my children, I can hear sometimes crying outside the door for me. And I feel horrible. Like, who, where are my obligations to my biological kids, my foster kids? And they can feel like I'm giving more time or energy there. Not always understanding why it's more challenging for them. Um, so that would be one of the challenging cases, but in general, they tend to feel that they deserve more understanding, um, a a little bit of the context of where they came from. You know, somebody just asked on the chat function here, why do they have to leave if they're getting along so well in your house? So let's talk for a minute about the difference, the purposes and differences between fostering and adoption Mm -hmm. and, um, why, this short-term system, this stopgap system, has the potential to be, you know, very nurturing, but isn't ultimately the the job of fostering to lead to adoption. Or are some foster children in temporary placement because the parents who love them very much are not able or well enough to look after them? Like, for example, Simone, in your case, what happened with that girl? Yeah. So in, in our case, it, it was, it was a temporary placement. So her parents had um, been arrested and her, um, her grandmother wanted custody of her, but for various reasons, she couldn't have custody of her right away. So the nine months that she lived with us, it was basically working towards her being reunited with the grandmother. So, you know, again, if it would have went a different direction, we would have went in a different direction, but that was the direction it was going. And I think a lot of times it, it truly is a temporary placement. Um, you know, again, the, the logistics of going into that, you know, re, reunification with the birth family is is one one piece of it. But, you know, understanding that you know, a lot of times that there's something that a child is going through, a, a family is going through that they can't can't go back and then therefore they're available to be adopted. Um, I know Rabbi knows a lot more about the, the foster foster to adoption part. Yeah, I, Rabbi Shmuley, fill me in a little bit about that because I, I guess another question I have is, is that when these children are in crisis and by nature of having to move from place to place and not having a stable home, you're going to be in crisis. It's going to be your default spot. Um, is it accepted by you? Like you have to totally internalize that this is not going to be easy. And is it harder for you or for them when they have to leave? Uh, thank you for that. And, uh, uh, you know, we used to have an orphanage system and that closed and it was replaced with a foster care system. And just looking at America, we have about 700,000 kids who pass through that system each year. At any given moment, about 400,000 kids. And our Torah says the ger, the yatom, the amana, the stranger, the vulnerable child, and the widow, we have to prioritize. And so these people are at the center of our consciousness as Jews. And when they come in, it's very difficult. It, it, it's, there, yes, there are, there are these amazing stories people share that are pure positivity. But by and large, the challenges are enormous. Mm-hmm. And the system is developed. Um, so that the goal is always primarily reunification. You want to get the child back with their biological family. That's the goal. Of course, sometimes it doesn't happen and it moves towards severance. um, And then the child is available for adoption by the foster family or by someone else. And in almost all of our cases, the children, all, all of our foster kids have moved back to reunification. Sometimes it's amazing because the single mother in poverty just couldn't make it. And she needed some time to get her life together and to get a job and to get organized and get off drugs. And she can, she gets her babies back. And that's like a beautiful moment where the kids go back. Other times, you know, I'm in the court hearing and I don't know the judge gets it right because the child's been with us for a year and they don't, the child was young enough that it doesn't even know the, the biological parent really. We're their family as they know it. It's not clear this parent really got their, their, their life together is, 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 uh, is sustainable. So, uh, and so it's, it, it's, it's often very hard for us and very hard for the kids as well. Okay, okay so like, let's just go into adoption for a minute. I wish I had you for two hours. I have a lot of questions and I hope I'm not being disrespectful. I just really want to know because it's something I've always wanted to do and I do want to understand, you know, what, it, what one is up against. Um, let's go to adoption for a minute. And Simone, I wanted to mention that you have a 
what would you call it? Multicultural family. Your your children, biological and adopted, are from different countries and are different races by birth. Actually, um, let's take a look at the picture of your family. It's a stunning photograph, beautifully shot. So I'm going to ask Eileen to put it up for me for a second. Thanks, Eileen. Okay. Hello. What yeah, a good they're pretty family. cute, right? <laughs> a good photographer. I mean, really and truly, beautiful. Okay. Thank thanks. You. Okay, so now that we have the Nachas of looking at them, just tell me a little bit, especially in these times. I spoke to you personally about, oh, about eight months ago when the whole racial thing exploded in America, and understandably so. And I, I wanted to ask you about that. What kind of stupid thing, oh, did I say that out loud? What kind of insensitive things do people say to a mom with a brood of kids that have different uh, colors and you know ethnicities and so on, what kind of things are you constantly having to adjust for or warn your kids of? And how does that play a role in family life when those kind of accommodations have to be made for what people say? Yeah, uh, you know, we're really, we're completely open and honest with our kids. We have every discussion you can imagine. Um, we think it's really important that they understand you know, their history and also to understand, you know, a lot of times when people say things, it's because they just don't know. I'm truly a believer that people want to be kind. And when they ask a question, they don't know how to pose a question because, you know, they've never asked it before. And again, I think we can't let fear, you know, rule us when we want to, you know, find out about something or, so I had, a, I'll tell a story about, um, I had an experience when I was at the grocery store and I had uh, our youngest, um, Millie, who's from Ethiopia. Um, she was, I had her in the, the cart and we were standing in front of the bakery and a woman came up to me and said, um, can I, can I ask you a question? And I said, sure. And her question was, how much did you pay for her? Oh no. And of course my yeah, my, my um, you know, I, I wanted to, you know, come out like with claws, but, you know, again, everything I do as a mother of six is a teaching moment. So uh, my response was, well, why do you ask? Um, first, let me tell you first that you don't pay for children. That's not how it works. And she said, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to offend you. Um, you know, my daughter's been trying to have to get pregnant. They haven't been able to. And I know she wants to adopt. And I'd really love to help them with the expenses. But I don't, you know, I wanted to see kind of like an idea of, of what I would need to save up to help her. So she was coming from like, sure. you know, pureness. She really, you know, she but she just didn't know how to ask. And so, you know, I think a lot of times that's what happens. Um, but we teach our kids to um, be, to really stand up for themselves, to, to really believe in themselves. So I remember once uh, the kids, Noah and Millie were on the playground. And so Noah's from South Korea, obviously Millie's from Ethiopia. And a kid came up to them and said something about, you know, how can you guys be siblings? And Millie's like, well, we're adopted, duh. You know, like, so they, you know, they get it. They, they, you know, they, they're proud of who they are. And again, everything is an open conversation in our house. And that works for us. Doesn't work for everybody, but that works for us. Oh, I, I, I want to dig into this a bit. One of the things that you said that struck me is that as, as a mother of, of, of all these children, every moment is a teaching moment. I would assert that as a mensch, as a, a, a Jewish mandate, that every moment is a teaching moment, or at the very least, an example of what it means to be a mensch, what that looks like. Now, Rabbi Shmuley, you caused a little bit of a Twitter storm with a post that you made. I think that goes a little bit to this multi-ethnic kind of family. Here we have, I believe, a Orthodox rabbi in a Santa suit. Tell me about this, please. And you're awfully yeah. slim for Santa. You needed another pillow in there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got into a little trouble for this one, as you as you mentioned. And um, I was talking with, with our two most recent foster boys. And they were very aware from school that Christmas was coming up. And this was a really big deal to them. And what was their experience going to be like? Because they remembered in the past how powerful and meaningful this was to them. Right. And Santa Claus, where are they going to? And I said, oh, my goodness, what am I going to do? And so I reached out to people. And I said, who can someone give some kind of experience? It's COVID. I can't, where am I going to take them? Walk down the street in a suit and nobody could do it. 
uh, COVID restrictions was a Jesus on me. And then, and then someone, a nice young Jewish woman in California, mailed me a suit. I said, oh, now it's really on me. She mailed me, it came in the mail, the suit. And so I, 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 uh, I ran in the garage, I put on this, this outfit, ran through the front door with some presents for them. And they, one, one, the, the uh, really little one cried, which is not, which is not rare uh, in front of a Santa Claus, but, but the older one did not, they loved it. And, and it's amazing because my Jewish kids, I explained to them, I said, here's what's going to happen as Jews. We don't believe in Santa Claus. Like, but these kids, like, this is something powerful for them culturally. And, um, and we want, we want to, you know, lift them up and we'll do what it takes. And, and I didn't, I didn't view it as any religious violation to do this for them. I viewed it as my responsibility as a foster parent. I think some people thought it was crossing a boundary for a rabbi to do that as if I was welcoming Christmas into the home. But that's the complexity of raising Jewish kids and raising foster kids that you're not raising Jewish in the home you have, and maintaining their culture. So we, yeah, we strive do you, to do both. How yeah. do you do that? For example, let's say, actually, yeah. so I'm gonna ask you the same question. Um, it seems that, um, that even you said earlier, Simone, that you celebrate the cultural backgrounds of the children that you adopted because their identity is important in the formation of, of their sense of self. But I'm assuming you're raising them as Jews. They're your children, right? Yeah. So yeah. Wh what happens when there is a cross-cultural sort of tension? Like for you, Rabbi Shmuley, um, I would assume that you have a kosher home, for example. You're a rabbi. Your house is probably kosher. Um, but if, if one of the foster kids that you're with wants to get a hot dog on the street, right? what do you do? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yo, sorry, Simon, you're going to go first there? No, go ahead. Go ahead. You're, you're, you're into it. Go. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> well, just quickly on that one. Um, yeah. I mean, my kids have always passed McDonald's and they know they're never going to McDonald's. And one time I took these two kids for their vaccines. They got their shots, these foster kids. And they were so sad. They were so sad. And, and the youngest one cried for his mommy. And so um, I knew they always were fed Happy Meals like every night of the week. So I went, I was like, I don't know how I'm going to do this as a kosher Jew and as a vegan, as a <laughs> vegan. And I went in the line and I ordered these two Happy Meals cringing, but these kids were the happiest kids they'd ever been. And my kids saw what they got these little toys from it. They were, they were jealous or whatever, but they understand that they operate in a different framework. And so um, it's part of the complexity of our home, and it hasn't in any way shook our kids' faith or foundation in their identity. They understand there's different uh, identities, and, and they're supportive of that. That is truly a momentum value of unity without uniformity. Simone, what did you want to say on that? Yeah, I mean, I would say, you know, very similar, you know, when we had the um, little girl living with us, um, she was with us over Christmas. So what we decided to do is we took her to Disney World. She had never been to Disney World before. Actually, we um, on the way there, she said that the only road trip that she had ever taken was to pick up diapers for um, her baby sister. And like that was like one of those moments where our kids were like, okay, this is even better. But you know, again, you know, I'm we knew that this was temporary and we want to respect what what she knows, what she believes in. And, and, you know, for our kids, it's not confusing to them. They know they're Jewish. They, you know, they, that's, that's what they know. And so when it's Christmas time, they're like, that's a really cool Christmas tree. And we're Jewish, you know, like that's how it works. <laughs> it, it's beautiful. You can help, you can understand your cultural or biological background, but, but, you know, Judaism is, is an operating system and a spiritual system that doesn't negate other uh, cultural experiences. It's just the spiritual piece of it is different. Actually, oh, there's so many questions. I don't know what I'm going to do. I want to ask you both two things. Um, oof, I'm sorry, I can't, can't decide. Oy. All right. For you, Rabbi Shmuley, how do we get involved in this, either as adopting or fostering? And right. what's your trajectory, A? And the B of it is, um, how do you help other families? I mean, families like Simone or other families who are in the weeds of it, if we're not going to do it ourselves, what can we do not to be? Beautiful. Beautiful. Just very, very briefly in, okay. in, in what we're doing at Yatom, yatom.org. If you want to pursue this, we have a family fellowship where we found the three biggest barriers people had who wanted to do this were financial, not having a community and not knowing what to do. So we create a family fellowship and that gives a stipend to the families to help to uh, financial costs that gives them a micro community they can process with and that gives them education uh, as to how to navigate the system. 
those who have already done it, that are currently foster parents or have already adopted and they're financially struggling, we have a micro grant program where we offer uh, financial support to, to such families. That's for those who want to pursue it themselves. If, you, if this is not for you, you're inspired by the vision of caring for the ghetto, um, but this is not for you or not right now, our Jewish community can do more. We can offer communal babysitting support for these families who can be overwhelmed and need, and need help. We can, we can help to be a part of a welcoming te team when these kids arrive. You know, in the community I'm in, when someone has a baby, a biological child, sometimes the community prepares meals because it's harder to prepare meals. I never, we never got that as a foster family. It's, it's just as hard in many ways, aside from a, the mother's recovery, of course. Um, and so sometimes preparing food for families who are absorbing new children. So feel free to reach out if any of that is, um, is uh, appealing. Incredible, thank you for that. And Simone, I'm gonna give you the final word here. What wisdom, mm -hmm. pleasure, strength, and hope from your experience as both a foster mother and an adoptive mother, would you give all of your Momentum sisters and the world at large? You know, there's so many amazing kids out there that are just waiting for a family to love them. And that's how our adoption journey started is that we knew we could be the, that family. You know, families don't have to match, but they're built on love. And I think that's the most important thing is that you love your kids. You love the foster kids that come into your home and everything else moves forward. And yes, there are struggles, but you know, three of the six best things we've ever done in our life, so. Oh my gosh, the two of you, I am, I'm humbled. As I said, thank you. Thank you from all of us in Momentum Land for the way you live your life. Rabbi Shmuley Simone, joining us today was a gift. We hope you'll join us again in the future. Thank you so much. And to the rest of my peeps out there, don't forget to register for that parenting series I told about. It starts this Thursday night with Dr. G and this. The topics are unbelievable. My kids are out of the house and I'm going to it anyway. And Join us on Wednesday, March 17th at 1 p.m. for something called Do Good Together, volunteering as a family. And really this rides on the heels of, it takes a community and a whole family to make a difference. How do we find time to reconnect as a family while still teaching our kids the values that are the most important, like empathy and compassion and generosity and gratitude? So author and speaker Natalie Silverstein is going to join us on Momentum Boost and share helpful tips and inspiration and resources for parents on how to incorporate service and mitzvahs and acts of chesed, loving kindness, into your busy schedule, even while we're social distancing. This boost is going to be made possible by the Steinberg Family Foundation. But for now, from me, Adrian Gold Davis, and from all of us at Momentum, Please remember as we learn and grow together that the highest form of wisdom is kindness. See you soon.